oldest to youngest there are Moses, Job, Lazarus, Boaz, Jedediah, the little girl is Maranatha, and we have yet to name the one on the way there. So April 23rd, one day separate from when you're, yep, it is due, so maybe they'll be born on the same day, wouldn't that be cool? Uh, but after that baby's born, uh, we're going to go ahead and get our paperwork in order for that uh, passport for that new baby, and Lord willing, we'll be able to get back into Indonesia by this summer. Uh, but in the meantime, we're still translating every day. Uh, my wife is the Bible translator. What chapter are you in right now? Psalm, Psalm 68. Yesterday you did Psalm 67. Uh, so Psalm 68 is what she's in. And in the evenings we, we uh, discuss different uh, Hebrew key terms, as we call them, and different uh, concepts that we're translating to make sure they're uh, translated accurately into the Tao language, and that's the language we work with. Uh, the Tao people of Indonesia, where we've been working for 17 years now, when we first went in there, they didn't have a written alphabet. Nobody in the entire tribe could read or write. So as we learned their language, we equated one symbol with every sound we heard. We made them a written alphabet. Uh, we began teaching them how to read and write in hopes that they would be able to someday be able to read God's Word in their own language. And my wife used that as a basis to begin translating the Bible into their language. Uh, right now, a couple years ago, we finished our New Testament in the Tao language. This is a copy of it. It says on the front, Ebatame me kapoge. Ebatame uh, means the Creator. Me is His, and kapoge breaks down white leaves. Because when they uh, first saw a book, that's what they equated it to in their mind, was uh, white leaves. So their Bible is called The White Leaves of the Creator. And uh, that, that's, that's their Bible. If you want to see it, we'll have it back there. And uh, we finished the Pentateuch, uh, the first five books of the Old Testament, last year. And now we're in Psalms. We're going to keep on going if the Lord lives us life, gives us life. Uh, Lord willing, eventually they will have the whole Bible in their language, and they'll be able to read it just like we do. Uh, have that same privilege that we enjoy every day, with, on, honestly, probably without even thinking about it. Uh, I don't know if you knew this, but as of right now, there's still uh, 4,300 languages, they say, in round numbers in, in this world that have not a single verse of Scripture translated into their language. Uh, so there's still a lot of work to do. There really is. There's a lot of work to do. And and, uh, you know, every time I see a new version of the Bible come out in English, whether it's the uh, soldier's version or the dad's version or the mom's version or, or the Boy Scout's version or whatever, I look at this and I think to myself, that's great, but man, wouldn't it be neat if all that effort had been put, in, put into getting the Bible into one of those 4,300 people groups that still don't have a single verse of the Bible into their language. So you guys have a part in that and helping us get the word to new places, and you've had a part in it for a long time, so thank you for that. So uh, if there's different pictures that are, if, if they were able to come up, these are some different pictures of, of uh, the work we've been doing. This is them studying their Bibles when we're doing classes over there. Uh, a bunch of my friends are in there, and this is what their church looks like. They don't have nice seats and air conditioning and heating and all this stuff. We sit on the floor. Uh, we actually made that floor for them out of rough-hewn uh, woods, and those are Bible pictures up on the walls. And uh, this is what a church service looks like in the Dow tribe uh, as we work there. Um, there's, a, there's a number of other pictures they, they, can, they can flip through there. But, and I also brought a video. There's our kids with a bunch of their buddies over there in the Dow tribe. And I don't know if you guys remember this or not, but when we first got over there, uh, as we were learning their language, we didn't know why they accepted us the way they did. Uh, because at first, when we were first finding them, uh, we went up this uh, muddy tur twisty, turny jungle river, and we ended up in a standoff where guys had bows and arrows, and they were, they were facing us, and we didn't know what was going to happen, but then they accepted us, and we didn't know why, because they couldn't speak our language, we couldn't speak theirs. As we learned their language, eventually, when we could understand it well enough, they told us that the reason they accepted us is because one generation before we got there, their fathers, multiple men in multiple villages, has ha had had the same dream which was the dream that someday there would be strange-looking people, pale-skinned people, that would hike into their valley system, somehow learn their language, and then after they uh, heard a great message from these foreigners, they would become so close with the foreigners that they'd become like family. And then when we finally arrived a full generation later, they saw us as the fulfillment to that dream because God had prepared them before we ever got there. 
And then when we finally taught for the first time, we didn't start with Jesus in the New Testament, like oftentimes people do here in America. We started with Genesis, teaching a concept of, of a good God, a God that's good in nature, that wants to do us good, that has no sin in him, and, and that's more powerful than all else. And we built on that foundation, first teaching about Adam and Eve, about the fall of mankind, and then eventually through the uh, formation of the nation of Israel, those big stories in the Old Testament, like the story of Noah and the giving of the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai and all these different stories. We taught through those first, then we taught through all the prophecies of the coming Redeemer that God promised, even from Genesis, would someday come and He would crush the head, right, of the serpent. We taught through all that. We taught for two months before we ever mentioned the name Jesus even once. But then when we finally mentioned Jesus for the first time, they knew exactly who He was, because they had heard us teach about this prophecy of this coming Redeemer, and they recognized that He fulfilled all the prophecies from the Old Testament, every single one. And they, He came on the scene, and He started doing all these things that no ordinary man could ever do, and then eventually they crucified Him, and they understood, uh, as they heard the story, they understood that what Christ did was for them, and the Tao Church was born in that place. So it was, it's amazing to see God work in a place like that, just to, to see the power of it all, and it's, it's, it's awesome. But uh, in a moment, I'm going to uh, preach from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Uh, we're going to look at verses 7 through 12 today. And the reason we're going to look at that is just honestly, honestly, it's because I've been, it's what I've been studying in my own life. Uh, I've been reading through First and Second Corinthians in my own life, and God's been teaching me, and I feel like He's given me a message to share this morning with you guys. But before I uh, share that message this morning, uh, I also brought along a video clip, if it, if it works all right, and it's about five minutes long, and I believe it'll just give you a better picture of what things have been like in the Dow tribe over the past uh, so many years since we've seen you, and uh, you'll be able to see... Uh, the smiles on the people's faces, see some of them firsthand, and just know as you watch this, these, these people are some of our best friends. Uh, we consider them family. They're amazing people. And uh, I hope you get as much joy out of watching this as I do over and over again, but I, I love seeing it. What does it feel like to be involved in frontline missions? To be a traveler as part of your lifestyle? To feel like you can go anywhere and everywhere? And to see firsthand that there are many places in this world that still have no access to the truth? like to feel free to experience these new places, free to experience different cultures, free to try new foods and make new friends, and to feel that that freedom and those friendships are all for a greater purpose. is a freedom like no other. It's an experience unlike anything else. And it's a lifestyle that has a greater goal in mind and revolves around that goal. This life is a decision. It's a decision to step out despite the fears that would hold us back an opportunity to trust that when Jesus told us to go into all the world and share the good news with every creature, he meant it. Realize that God has an intricate plan to gather his bride from every language group, tribe, and nation and that that plan involves every single one of us, including you. Hey. Realize that you have only one life to live on this earth, 
and that there is something far greater than ourselves that is worth living for. Realize that there's no special call from God that you must have in order to do what He has already commanded you to do. God has already commanded all of us to go. So if anything at all, you should need a call if you're going to stay. as exciting as seeing God work firsthand. And we are convinced that there is no greater adventure than living a life that is a part of the cool things that God is doing in this world. To travel the globe with a purpose, to forge deep and unique friendships that last a lifetime, to learn another language with a greater goal in mind, to be able to translate God's word into that language for the very first time, and then to be able to finally hand them their first copies of God's word in their own language is something that neither we nor they will ever forget. that's keeping you from stepping out in faith and being a part of the exciting things God is doing in this world? And what if you were the one that was born into some remote and isolated village on the edge of the world? What if you had never even held a Bible in your own language and still wondered what would happen to you after death? Wouldn't you hope that someday, somehow, someone might just step out and come to you? So these are the people we've been working with, and, and these people, man, they're just amazing, amazing, wonderful people. And it's been so neat to see God work in their life and to, to change that tribe. And as we go back and forth, we often get the question, uh, do you take all your family with you? Do you take your kids with you? And, and uh, I, I can tell you that, that we do. We don't leave them here. Um, we take them with us. And the way I see it, every single one of those kids is missionaries in training. Uh, I think about the fact that there's 4,300 people groups still waiting, and it's my prayer that maybe God will raise up some, if not all of them, to reach seven more tribes that I've yet to hear for the first time. And I'll tell you what, man, it's, 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 it's wild to think about what God can do uh, with someone like me and what He can do with, uh, with our kids. Uh, as I've been thinking through what to share this morning, uh, and I've been reading through First and Second Corinthians in my own life, and, uh, and also, I've been talking to different pastors, even around Florida. Um, one of the themes that God keeps teaching me about in my own life, and that He keeps bringing back to mind, is uh, the way that He works through afflictions and the way that He works through suffering in our lives. Last Sunday, I shared at a church in Hudson, Florida, not too far north of here, maybe about an hour, and the pastor uh, he had just recently come through COVID. Uh, he had uh, just taken his, his wife to the hospital because she had been diagnosed with cancer. Uh, she had breast cancer, and then, and then when she was supposed to go in for the treatments, they couldn't treat her because she got COVID on top of it. Through all of that, they had two kids. They were fostering twins, and they had to give up these children to another family. 
and things like that. And he was just really heartbroken. And amidst, amidst all that, trying to, to minister to the church that he was ministering to with a huge homeless ministry outreach every Wednesday. And he was just facing a lot of suffering and affliction. And I uh, have heard about a number of other friends that lived down here that have been, that have been lost. Uh, the Lord's taken them through COVID pneumonia and through these different things and the different afflictions. You know, these are strange times, aren't they? They are very strange times. You know, we can look at it and we can get discouraged, but I think if we look at 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians and other parts of the Bible and we remind ourselves of the way that God works through afflictions, that can be a great encouragement to us. And to you, because I know it is to me, and I know it is also to my children as I read through different passages. So I'm going to read 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through 12, and then I'm just going to pray one more time and ask God to bless our time together, and uh, perhaps He will encourage you this morning in the same way that He's been encouraging me in my own personal life. So 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 7 through 12 say this, they say, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but we're not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken, We're struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death, for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for what an encouragement it is to me, Lord. I thank you that your word gives us hope, and I thank you that I can stand in a church right now, as as this man was sharing earlier, that keeps your word foundational, that teaches things that are even unpopular amidst our culture. Lord, I thank you for this church, and I thank you for the way that they've been standing behind us all this time and praying for us and supporting us, Lord. And I just pray that again this morning you would do that work that only you can do. I know that I cannot change hearts, but I know that you can. And I pray that you would change my heart in some way this morning, Lord. That you would challenge me through your word, even though I'm the one speaking it. That you would challenge my children and my wife, help them to learn something new. Lord, and that you would help everybody in here to see what you would have for us from your word this morning. And I thank you, Lord, for the privilege it is to open your word and look at it in our own language when there are still 4,300 people groups that don't have a single verse of your word in their own language. What a privilege we have. Amen. You know, this this passage, it's going with a theme. Uh, Two weeks ago, uh, I I preached from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and then uh, uh, another Sunday I preached recently from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and now I'm looking at 2 Corinthians 4, and one of the themes I see through First and 2 Corinthians over and over again is Paul talks about how God loves to use weak and foolish things, things that in and of themselves have nothing to offer, people that have nothing to offer, nothing to brag about, nothing to boast about. And the reason that's such an encouragement to me is because that's me. That's me. I have nothing to offer. I think I've, I've shared with Pastor before, I was a, a C and a D student, right? Uh, I grew up in the, mainly in the city, not, not back in the woods uh, shooting stuff and killing stuff. I didn't have anything to offer and going over to the middle of the jungle. But God used me anyway. My biggest fear going over there even, I, I feared it even honestly more than being taken by Muslims, <laughs> and because it's a large Muslim country. It's the world's most populous Muslim nation, and that was a fear of ours going over there. But one of my major fears was that I was too stupid to learn another language, because I was a D student in high school. I nearly flunked out, and then when we got in college, I actually got kicked out of one college, 
And the other college, my wife did all my homework, and that's the only way I got a degree. It's not valid. <laughs> I, have, I have nothing in and of myself. I have nothing to offer, nothing. But God used us anyway. And that's an awesome thing to think about. And when I look at these passages in First and Second Corinthians, I wonder if that's how Paul felt oftentimes. And even beyond that, he used to persecute the church of Christ, right? He was a murderer, all these different things that he had going against him. And he seems to brag over and over again that he has nothing to brag about. That Christ is the only thing that's going good for him, really, that that he has going for him at all. And then I see again in this passage, he says, we have a treasure in jars of clay. He describes us as jars of clay. And then it says, to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. There's a number of different places that the Bible describes us uh, in that way, like we're, like we're clay. Uh, another one of the passages I was looking at this morning was in Romans 8, 20 through 21, uh, where it talks about how we are like lumps of clay, and, and then it says, who are we to question God? Who are we to question God for what He's made us into? He's made some vessels for honor, some for dishonor. That's another place where it likens us to clay. But in this specific place, it talks about jars of clay. You think about a jar of clay. What's a jar of clay like? It's something that you could take and you could drop it from a low height and it would just shatter. It's, it's weak. It's something that we form. One of my kids, Moses, Moses is an artist. He loves to paint. And the last two or three days, all my kids, honestly, they've been uh, sitting, and we, we live in a camper when we're on the road, and they've been sitting in front of the camper playing with Play-Doh and making all these interesting creatures. And uh, yesterday he made a, what did you call that, a monkey duck? He made a, a monkey duck, this monkey-looking thing with the duck bill and all these teeth. It was pretty cool, you know, and they do all this role-playing, and eventually they'll get tired, and they'll just smash the things, and they'll all laugh and so on. And I was talking to the kids about that and this verse, and I was saying, you know, when you make something, when you make a new creation, like, do you just make it as you go, or do you think about it? Do you plan it out, how you're going to make this thing? And they all agreed that, oh, they, they think it through, and they, they get an idea in their head, and then they make it the way they've got this idea formed in their head. And I, and I said, don't you think maybe God was similar in that way? He formed us to be what we are. He put thought in it. He intricately planned everything about us, from, from our weaknesses to our strengths, every single bit of it. He planned it for a purpose. Even the afflictions that we go through, you know, I believe God's sovereign in every sickness He brings us through. I believe He's sovereign and that He has a purpose in it and that He plans it for His glory. I believe that. There's a lot of people that don't believe that, but I believe that. I believe that He plans even our sicknesses, even our afflictions. And in times like these, it's very important to know that and to believe that, that God has a purpose even in the sicknesses that He brings us through, and it's for His glory. God didn't have to make us into weak people that get one Omicron, Delta, coronavirus variant after another. God didn't have to make us into weak people that get malaria over and over and over again every time we go to the field and see our kids get it, but He did. Why? Verses like this, passages like this, tell us why. It says, we have this treasure in jars of clay and these weak vessels to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not us. That's why God made us as such weak vessels, to show His power. That's why He made us that way. It goes on in verse 8, and it talks about how we're afflicted in every way, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but not driven to despair. To despair. That's one of my favorite words in that verse, perplexed. Do you ever feel perplexed at what God's bringing you through, at what God's bringing this world through and your community through? I do. I'm perplexed all the time. I don't understand it. But even in not understanding it, we can be at a point where we're not driven to despair. Because we trust that God is in control and that He's working through it, through everything that He brings us through. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. We're struck down, but we're not destroyed. 
Yeah, I think about the writer of this passage and all the different things that he's gone through for the sake of the gospel. If you look at other parts in First and Second Corinthians, in First Corinthians 1, 26 through 29, uh, he talks about how God uses what is foolish and so on. And he talks about how God uses things that don't come from noble birth, that are weak from the world's standard. And then he goes on later on in 2 Corinthians in chapter 11, verses 23 through 30, and he lists some of the different afflictions that God's brought him through. Listen to this one passage, which some of you guys are probably familiar with. He says, I've had far greater labors, far more imprisonments. I've had countless beatings. I've often been near death five times. At the hands of the Jews, I received 40 lashes minus one. He says, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. He says, I've been on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, dangers from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, dangers from false brothers. I've been in toil and hardship through many sleepless nights. I've been in hunger and thirst and often without food. I've been in cold and exposure and apart from all these things, there's daily pressure on me and anxiety for all the churches. And then he says, who's weak and I'm not weak? Who's made to fall and I'm not indignant? But if I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. What a list. (laughs) What a list of things to go through. You know, and then, then we go through COVID and we freak out. What a list of things to go through. And he comes to the end of all that. And he says, If I'm going to boast, I'm going to boast in the things that that show my weakness. Paul knew something that we need to know, which is that God works through our weakness. He works through our afflictions. He works through our sicknesses. And the book of Psalms goes as far as to say that every single one of our days are numbered before a single one of them comes to be. You realize God's planned out your day of death even. He knows what it is, even though you don't know what it is. He knows what mine is, even though I don't know what it is. He knows. He's sovereign over it all. He's sovereign over every single bit of it. And we have to trust in that. That's what is a theme all throughout First and Second Corinthians. That's something that God's been teaching me about in my own life and been comforting me through. I mentioned I, I preached on 2 Corinthians chapter 1, chapter 1 uh, recently, and verses 3 through 6 say some really cool things in them about how God brings us through afflictions and what He uses it for. Listen to these verses, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. It says this, Blessed be the God of our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. He comforts us in all of our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. And if we're afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we're comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. So we've already seen multiple reasons this morning why God brings us through afflictions, why He's made us into weak vessels. There's two more in these passages. It says, He brings us through afflictions so that He can show us His comfort, and then we can experience that comfort and then give that comfort to other people that are in any other affliction. Even beyond that, it's not only for our comfort, but he says in verse 6, it is for your comfort and salvation. In other words, so that we can experience his salvation, and then we can show his salvation to a watching world all around us. That's why God brings us through affliction. Right? That's why he brings us through it. So that he can have us experience his comfort 
and then show it to others so we can experience His salvation and then point others to His salvation. How does that practically work? How does that practically work? Well, I can think of multiple times where God has specifically used suffering and affliction in the Tao tribe to point them towards Jesus. There's multiple examples that come to mind, but right off the bat, the first example that comes to mind is that when we were studying their language and their culture, they were also studying us and asking a lot of questions about our culture. We'd come from a strange place. They weren't familiar with us and, and our ways. They would sit and they'd watch the way we cooked food and study us and what we did. They would listen to our language as Jenny and I spoke it to each other. And uh, they would kind of mimic us and ask us to teach them different words. And uh, to them, our language sounds like a whole bunch of S's, right? They, I'd be talking to Jenny and then uh, I had this one buddy. He, he died a few months ago, but his name was Yoni, and he used to always mimic me. And he would go, shwi shwa shwi shwa shwi shwi shwa 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 shwa. That's what English sounded like like to him. And I would joke with him and say, "Oh man, you're so good at my language, right?" And and he would laugh, and I would laugh. And anyways, uh, they were asking us a lot of questions. And one of the first questions I understood from them, they asked me. They said, uh, "They said, dig up here. We've answered a lot of questions about our culture. Now today we have a." a new question for you about your people, and they said, our question is this, do your people die? And I thought I'd heard them wrong. I thought, surely they're not asking this, and sure enough, that's what they were asking. They said, no, really, do your people die? They did, at first, they thought we were so strange that maybe, maybe we were from a place where people didn't die, honestly. That's what they thought about us. They asked us this question, and I said, well, of course my people die. We die just like you die. But uh, when we first got in that tribe, there was only two people with gray hair. Everybody else dies before that point. The average life expectancy is about 35 years old in the jungles of Indonesia. And they asked me, they said, okay, your people die. They said, is your, is your father still alive? And I said, yes, he is. And he's still alive right now. And uh, they kind of shook their heads like, yeah, right, you die. Your father's still alive. And then they asked me, well, is your grandfather still alive? And I said, at that time he was. So I said, yes, he is. And then they all just really shook their heads. They didn't believe me. They didn't believe me that we die. You know, you know when they finally believed that we die? A number of months after that, we got a strand of malaria, Jenny and I, uh, that goes and it lies dormant in your liver, and it comes out over and over again whenever your body gets weak. And for six months in a row, we had malaria. It came out the same time, every, every three or four weeks. And then we'd be laying in bed. And honestly, uh, in America, COVID is the closest thing that I've experienced to malaria. Uh, it's, it's different again, but it's, but it's similar. You have that pounding headache, you know, and all this stuff, and you just lay in bed, your whole body aches, and so on. And, you know, when you get a sickness in the Tao tribe, they don't just let you rest. They actually gather around your house as a tribe, and they yell into your house. They yell over and over again, Nemo me epa yai, Nemo me epa, which means friend, love to you, love to you. They're basically saying, get better, get better. They're showing their sympathy. So if you want to rest to get better, forget about it. You're not going to. You're just going to lay there and listen to people yell into your house, right? But it's because they love you. And uh, they would go on and on like this. And eventually, after six months in a row of this, this same guy, his name was Daokagi, that asked me if my people die. He said, friend, he said, uh, you keep getting this malaria. He said, he said, what do you do when you get malaria in your country to get rid of it? And I said, well, Daokagi, friend, I said, we, we don't have malaria in my country. And he, he kind of shook his head, and he's like, really? I said, yeah, we, we don't have it. And he said, what about dinghy fever? What do you do when you get that in your country, and you're sick with that in your country? And I said, friend, we don't really have that in my country. And he said, you don't have dinghy fever in your country? And I said, no, not really. He said, what about these stomach diseases we get all the time? And he's, he's describing Giardia and, and uh, amoeba that they constantly deal with. He says, what do you do when you get that in your country? And I said, friend, we don't really get that in my country either. And eventually he, he says, well, then friend, he said, why are you staying here? Why don't you go back to your own country? Then you won't be sick all the time. But you know what? That question points to an amazing answer. And the answer that I gave him was, friend, 
We're staying here even though we keep getting sick over and over again because our message that we came to bring you is so beautiful and so wonderful and so important that it's worth staying here through the sickness to give it to you. You know, you think about that. God uses our afflictions. He uses our sicknesses because it's during times of sicknesses that we gain credibility with the suffering, afflicted people that we're trying to minister to. They see in times of sickness where our hope really is. You know, the, the church should not have the same reaction to sickness that the world has. We should be different. This is not a time to blend in. It's a time to stand out. And to show the world that we have a hope, no matter what we're threatened with. The only thing that COVID can threaten us with is what we long for the most. And that is to be with Jesus. That is to be with Jesus, okay? Think about this. What does the world see when they look at us? What do they see? I believe God wants to use our sicknesses and our afflictions to show others His comfort and His salvation. I've seen him do it in the jungle, and I know he wants to do it here. He's sovereign in everything he brings us through. There's this other powerful verses, you know, in, in, this, uh, in this couple books of Corinthians. Can I read to you some of my favorite verses from these books? They're in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 55 through 56. They say this, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. For us, death has no sting. For us, the grave has no victory. All of that was conquered with Jesus. That's what we need to be showing the world right now. Man, what an opportunity, what a time, what a time to show the victory we have in Jesus to a dying, afflicted, sick, hurting, scared, fearful world. What a time to show Jesus. What an opportunity, what an opportunity. It's amazing to think about. It really is. Going, going back to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, you know, you, you keep going in these verses. In verse 10, he goes on, he says, We're always carrying in the body the death of Jesus. And then there's a so that. I love it when there's a so that because it couldn't get much clearer. We're always carrying in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live, we're always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us. We're all going to die, every single one of us. (laughs) We can't escape it. Death is at work in us. But life in you. God uses our afflictions. He uses this mortal, dying flesh to show other people His comfort, to show other people His salvation, to show other people that we have a treasure in these jars of clay that's greater than any other treasure this world has to offer. God uses it, and that's what He's encouraging me with in my own life right now. You can't escape suffering, right? We're all going to suffer. We're all going to suffer. You can't escape it. Uh, the, the Bible even says that very clearly in 2 Timothy 4.12. It says, all of those that, God, that, that desire to live godly lives in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. We will suffer. If you're trying to follow Jesus, you will suffer. There's no escaping it. If that is the case, what should be our attitude towards suffering? 
I believe that our attitudes towards suffering should be different than the world's attitude towards suffering and that God will use it in a powerful way. If this is the case, that we're all going to suffer, I don't believe we should see it as something to merely run from every time it comes along, but instead to look at it from a different perspective, to in a roundabout way, honestly, to embrace it when it comes along as ordained by a sovereign and loving God to show a world His comfort and salvation. That is how I believe we should look at it. Because it's not a question of if you will suffer, it's a question of when. We're all going to suffer. The question is, how will you meet it? How will you use it to show others Jesus when it comes? Because we're all going to get it. Every single one of us. You can't escape it. Oh, man, what an awesome thing to think about. What an awesome thing to think about. These verses, they, they, they make it really clear to me how God uses our suffering, how he's, He has sovereignly, purposely made us into weak vessels so that we can show that He is powerful. God had a plan in it, and He still has a plan in it. I think about some of the other ways that, that God used suffering in the Tao tribe. And, uh, you know, right when we were finally to a point where we had learned their language enough to teach them for the first time, uh, we'd been studying their language for, for months. We, we started off working in that tribe. We started with uh, two other families. So there was three families that went in as, as a missionary team, and the other two families, they quit in the first six months. And we almost quit too. After we had malaria all those times, we were getting ready to quit, to call in the helicopter and to come back to the U.S. And along that time is where we heard that story from the Dao people for the first time, that, he, that he'd prepared them a full generation before we got there for his message. And that encouraged us, and we realized that if we were, if we were going to stay, if we stayed, then we were going to get to be a part of something absolutely amazing, seeing God work in a unique way, because he'd been working there really long before we ever got there to prepare them for his message, right? So we stayed, and we were learning that language, and we found that it was a tonal language. Uh, so they spoke things at different uh, pitches to show different meanings, and that was a challenge to figure out, but the Lord helped us through it. We got that language. Uh, we finally got to the point to where we were teaching them for the first time. We started in Genesis. We taught for week after week after week for three months, and after three months of teaching, we finally get to the last week. And in the last week of teaching, when we're finally getting to really the climax, the culmination of the story, where they would find out that Christ died for them, and that through His death on the cross, they could be free from the burden of sin, and they could even experience eternal life someday and be, be with Jesus forever in, in, in heaven. We were getting ready to teach these last couple lessons, and we were so excited, right? But one morning, early in the morning... I got a, uh, uh, a, a radio wave transmission. We have these shortwave radios that we use for emergencies, like medical emergencies and so on. And uh, I heard on the radio someone saying, uh, someone that was based in a city that helped get us supplies saying, Scott, you need to call your family on your satellite phone as soon as you can because uh, there's some important news from your family. So I hung up the radio, and uh, later that morning, I got on my satellite phone, I called my dad, and I found out that my mom was having heart failure. She was having heart failure. We hadn't been back in the States for almost five years at this point, and we'd been separated from our family. All this time had passed. We'd finally learned this language. We'd been teaching this semi-nomadic people that had never heard about Jesus for the first time. We come to the last week, and then we're faced with this news that my mom is probably going to die. This is what we were told. And I'm thinking, is this what it comes down to? We, we're going to have to choose in between going back to the U.S. and seeing my parents one last time, or teaching these people the last week of this teaching where they get to hear about Jesus for the first time. And we didn't know what to do. We almost called the helicopter to take us back so that we could try to get back to the U.S. in time to see her before she went into surgery, but we didn't have peace about it. So we prayed, and we prayed, and we prayed, and we, we thought about it and thought about it, and 
There was a very specific verse that the Lord brought to my mind, and the only verse I could really think about over and over again, it was Luke 9.60. Luke 9.60 says this, it says, let the dead bury their dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. It's the only verse I could think of. Jenny and I talked about it, we thought about it, we decided we were going to stay. And that if I didn't get to see my, my mom again, uh, this side of heaven, she had that hope, and I'd be able to see her again in eternity. We stayed, and I went down that, that last week when we were going through those final lessons, te- getting ready to tell them about Christ's sacrifice for them, and, and the people could see the tears in my eyes and kind of the distress on my face as I went to teach them. They asked me what was going on, and I explained to them that my mom was probably going to die, but we, were pro- but we were going to stay there anyway. Because this message was so important that they needed to hear the end of it. So we stayed. And as we were teaching that day, we were teaching through those uh, last couple lessons about how they had Jesus before Pilate. And they were getting ready to to beat him and crucify him as we know the story goes. And uh, we didn't teach that final day, but we were teaching the lessons on Pilate. That evening, after we got done teaching that morning... There was a runner sent up from another village two days' hike away with the news that a very prominent woman had died in a village two days away. When people die in the Dao tribe, they drop everything, everything. They don't do garden work, they don't hunt, they set their bows and arrows aside, and they come together and they mourn that death, usually for about two weeks. So I fully expected that the whole tribe would say, we need to finish this message. When we get back, we're all going down to that village where that lady has died. That's what I thought would happen. But the next morning, we got together, and to my surprise, everybody was there. Nobody had left. I got up to teach them about that final part of the story about how Jesus was going to be crucified for sins, and the chief of the tribe, Totopui, he stood up, and he said, Degapia, they call me Degapia, that's what they named me, it means tall white tree. <laughs> he see, the chief of the tribe, he stood up and he said, I've got something to say. And I said, what is it, Totopui? That was his name. And he said, listen, he said, I know that there has been talk of everybody leaving. He said, but what we need to do is stay. He said, because if this message is important enough, to where even when Degapia's own mother was dying back in his land, they were going to stay. He said, then it's important enough for us to stay too. And I saw God work through my mom's heart ailment in America to show his worth to a tribe in the middle of the jungle in Indonesia. And it blew me away. I really believe that God did that for his glory, to show his worth. Now, my mom lived. She's still alive. She's actually on her way to Florida right now, and we're going to have dinner with her tomorrow night, and that's amazing. But my point is this. Nothing, nothing in the Christian's life, I don't believe any of it, is just by chance. God is sovereign, and we're all going to face suffering. The question is, what are we going to do with it when it comes? Are we going to use it to show a watching world the comfort that we experience in Jesus, that we are not afraid of death because we're going to be with Jesus and the power of our salvation? I hope so. I hope so. That's a challenge to me, and I hope it's a challenge to you. This passage, again, verse 10, we're always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus will be manifested in our bodies. For we who live, we're always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus will be manifested or shown in our mortal flesh. Death is at work in us, it is, but life in you. God, I thank you for your word. I thank that you are sovereign. You are in control of everything you bring us through, Lord. Help us to trust you. Help us to trust that you have a purpose in it. And help us to see the afflictions that you sovereignly bring us through as mere opportunities in disguise. To show a watching, hurting, hopeless, 
world that we have no fear of death. There is no sting in death for us, and the grave has no victory over us because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Lord, continue to help this church to be an awesome light in this community. And I thank you for the way that they've stood behind us all these years. Thank you, Lord. Amen.